Uh, thank you so much uh, for coming to those in the audience. Um, uh, my name is David Shanzer, uh, the leader uh, of this project. Uh, and uh, we're here to discuss uh, a report that we are issuing today uh, called The Challenge and Promise of Using Policing Strategies to Prevent Violent Extremism. Um, very glad to see a lot of friends and colleagues uh, in the audience. I think it's because all of us share a mutual interest in this topic. How do we prevent acts of violence like took place in San Bernardino last month and in Charleston, North Carolina uh, last uh, summer? You know, these acts uh, account for a very small percent of the violence uh, in America, uh, but uh, they generate a disproportionate amount of fear. Uh, they undermine confidence in our institutions. They tear our social fabric. Uh, they cause a government uh, reaction. Some would say a government overreaction. So uh, it's really in our national interest to prevent these types of acts of terrorism. And I think it's a very noble pursuit that I know many of you are engaged in on a day-to-day -day basis to try to prevent uh, these, uh, uh, this violence before it occurs. Uh, before we just dive into the subject matter, uh, I do want to say a couple of quick thank yous. Uh, Jeff Harris and Alyssa Dack at our Duke and DC office who put this together. Our research was funded uh, by the National Institute of Justice uh, and the United States Department of Justice. A uh, friend, colleague, and uh, our, our grant manager, John Piccarelli, is here, and he's been a great person to work with, and I thank him for the support and uh, effort he put in. Of course, uh, the report is uh, the, the opinions of the authors alone, not any representation of the government, uh, but it's very helpful to have uh, the funding uh, that we received to do this research. Um, also, I, I have Brett Steele from the uh, Department of Justice has been a, a big supporter uh, as well. Uh, my co-authors, uh, Charles Kurzman, professor of sociology at UNC Chapel Hill, a friend and partner on this for uh, many years. We've been working together. Uh, Jessica Tolliver, uh, to his right, um, from the Police Executive Research Forum, the director of technical assistance uh, there, has been a, a wonderful colleague. Our uh, other co-author, Elizabeth Miller, uh, is in the front seat, and Elizabeth did a lot of the interviews and work on this report and did a terrific job. Um, and on behalf of both, all of my co-authors, I want to thank our guests uh, for being here to comment on the report. Uh, we have uh, Chief uh, J. Thomas Manger from the uh, Montgomery County Police Department. Uh, we're very honored to have him taking time out of his important duties to, to talk with us today. Uh, and we have uh, Dahlia Mogahed, who's the research director of the Institute for Policy and Understanding which is a think tank with offices here and in Michigan. Uh, and she is straight from an appearance on The Daily Show with Trevor Noah. So she is officially the coolest person in the room, <laughs> um, certainly on the standards of any college uh, student, which Charlie and I are very familiar with. Uh, so um, and also they, uh, Dahlia and Chief Manger, did, did not participate in the report. And again, they're here to uh, comment on it. Uh, but. The findings and the conclusions, uh, they're not responsible uh, for them. Um, let me just make a quick few overarching points, and I'm going to turn it over to my uh, colleagues. Uh, so in 2011, President Obama issued a national strategy, uh, which was called Empowering Partnerships with Law Enforcement to Counter Violent Extremism. And really, a key element of that strategy was to have police and communities build partnerships and together find ways to try to prevent these kinds of acts of violence. So what our project did, uh, starting uh, many years after the strategy was issued, was really to try to assess how this concept was being implemented uh, in the field uh, by local police departments, and also how the communities that were uh, uh, going to be partnered with uh, how they were responding uh, and what they thought about the policing efforts uh, to do outreach and engagement. Now we're well aware, and all the authors are well aware, that there are multiple forms of extremism uh, in the United States. Extremism inspired by uh, first Al-Qaeda and now ISIS, maybe both of them, and uh, also extremism inspired by anti-government, uh, racist, anti-capitalist, and other uh, ideologies. So we fully understand that. 
Now, this project was focused primarily on prevention of al-Qaeda and ISIS-inspired terrorism because, frankly, we found that this was the core focus of the policing programs uh, that we were able to identify in our field work. So what you'll hear today is about the results of our discussions with police about their efforts to engage with Muslim American communities and our focus groups uh, with Muslim American community members in the eight cities uh, around the country. Now, you will see in our recommendations, uh, we discuss that a lot more work needs to be done on prevention efforts with respect to the anti-government, racist, and other forms of extremism. And I'm sure we'll get some questions from you and some discussion from our panelists on this topic as we go along. So with those few uh, uh, framing comments, let me turn it over to Professor Kurzman. Thanks very much. Uh, again, I'm Charlie Kurzman. I'm a professor of sociology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and co-director of the Carolina Center for the Study of the Middle East and Muslim Civilizations. I'd like to say a few words about the methods that we used for this research project. The first method was a survey conducted uh, uh, with the help of our partners at the Police Executive Research Forum of 382 state, county, and municipal law enforcement agencies. Uh, we uh, were able to get a uh, response rate of uh, over 70 percent. Uh, we got a huge portion of the large municipal agencies around the country and a good number of state agencies as well, covering, all told, 86 percent of the uh, United States population in their cumulative jurisdictions. We asked them a series of questions, uh, including what forms of uh, community engagement were they involved with in the prevention of violent extremism and found that more than three quarters of these law enforcement agencies were engaged in at least one form of community outreach in this area. Among the large municipal agencies, the percentage was even higher, almost nine out of ten of the uh, agencies that uh, responded to our survey. We followed that up with in-depth interviews with uh, law enforcement officials at 19 uh, agencies around the United States, as well as with uh, field visits at, uh, where to uh, hold focus groups and interviews with Muslim American community members in eight sites around the US and five uh, site visits for conversations with law enforcement officials. What we found in these conversations is a fair bit of mistrust between some community members and some uh, members of, of uh, law enforcement. But we also found numerous models of community partnerships, such as a sports league in one city where young Muslim Americans saw police officers as coaches and mentors. In another city, officers uh, were uh, working with Muslim shopkeepers who had concerns about theft in their neighborhood as a problem there, criminal problem. In another area, uh, there was a volunteer project where law enforcement officials uh, in their free time uh, helped, uh, partnered with a local mosque to clean up vacant lots in the neighborhood that were being used for criminal activity. And police officials and community members got to know one another through this activity. Uh, in another area, we heard about a relationship with, uh, with the police that helped put mosque uh, members in touch with the social service agency in order to help a homeless member of their congregation who needed assistance. And that personal relationship with law enforcement turned out to be a really useful avenue to find out what kind of services would be available. So one of the central recommendations that comes out of our report is that the full range of these kinds of activities and engagements with community members can be a real boon to building relationships of trust, overcoming whatever uh, uh, bad media, bad press, and uh, poor experiences may exist out there and are worth replicating, we believe, at, in communities and uh, jurisdictions around the country. Thank you. Turning over to uh, Jessica. Hi, my name is Jessica Tolliver. Um, I'm with the Police Executive Research Forum. I am the Director of Technical Assistance. And for those of you not familiar with PERF, um, we are a research and membership organization. In addition to research, we provide management services, technical assistance, and executive level education to support law enforcement agencies. Um, 
So I'll try and keep it short. They've given you a lot of background. I'm going to talk about the site visits we conducted. We Based on the survey results and the 19 agencies we spoke to on the phone, we chose seven sites to travel to, spend a few days there, and we spoke with the executive of the agency, the supervisors, the line officers, and the outreach and engagement team members, as well as the community members that they worked with. And for each of these agencies and folks we met with, we um, signed a confidentiality agreement because we think it was very important that they be able to speak frankly with us, um, not so we could identify not only these promising practices, but also the lessons learned. We, want to, we wanted to know about the missteps as well so we could help inform other agencies looking to implement these similar programs. Um, so the key findings based on these site visits and conversations First is that it has to be a whole community approach. Um, this means that the outreach program actively engages with all subsets of the community, um, not just a particular group. Um, similarly, this program should address the whole spectrum of public safety concerns and quality of life concerns. Um, so for example, if you're reaching out to um, a community and you're having these conversations, you're, you're not just asking them for information, you're offering your services, you're explaining to them what the police can do for you, and hopefully you're introducing them to other government agencies that can help them with quality of life issues. So if um, there's a problem with speeding near, uh, say, in their neighborhood near a mosque, then you can help them figure out how to get speed bumps in the area, and that's a quality of life issue that will help. Um, you can also, help with getting lights installed on a, on a stretch of the, the street that's too dark and makes them feel unsafe. So these are ways that you can build communication and trust with these community members, showing them that you have an actual interest and ability to help them with their quality of life issues. Um, we also found that cultural competency, of course, is important when first recruiting outreach team members. But what really matters most is personality. So, um, of course, we say you should have a diverse outreach team, and to the extent possible, it should reflect the communities that you're conducting outreach with. But really, the individuals you choose to be part of that team have to have not necessarily an outgoing personality that's going to, hi, nice to meet you, whatever. They can be shy, they can be reserved. They just have to have a genuine interest in making those connections and learning about the culture and the people that they're working with. Because everybody senses that. They, they, and they have to be willing, like curious, to learn. Tell me about your community. Tell me about your concerns. Um, we really found the most successful team members were those that didn't have any qualms about asking questions and making m mistakes, maybe, but just so they learn. They're open to learning. They're curious. Um, so our research also showed language training and cultural awareness training are very important. Um, some of the lessons learned for cultural awareness training. We met with um, an executive whose first attempt to engage the community was to host a town hall and invite Muslim Americans from a subset of their community to attend. And um, as an icebreaker, they decided to bring their bomb sniffing dog. Well, <laughs> dogs are <laughs> considered impure um, for this subset of the community, and they were horrified. They didn't want to go near the dog. This did not break the ice. This made everybody uncomfortable, and it was a big lesson learned. If they had done some cultural background, um, they would have known. There's also another example where um, a male officer was trying to introduce himself to female members of the um, town hall audience and trying to shake their hands, not realizing that it's inappropriate to shake the hands of the opposite sex unless you're related. Um, so, you know, little things like that make a big impact if you have some sort of cultural awareness. And a great way to get that awareness is not only through research, but connecting with leaders within that community. They are happy to give you that information and share with you, like, when you approach people, this is what you should do, this is what you should say. 
Um, and, you know, a lot of law enforcement agencies don't have the resources to put their outreach and engagement teams through intensive language training, but perhaps you can do key phrases, laminated cards, so that you are, when you approach these different groups, you're showing that you have an interest in learning their language and culture, and you, I'm, this is all I know, but let's talk, and it's a way to introduce yourself. Um, I know I'm going over my amount of time, I'm sorry. Uh, I'll just skip to the really, really important one. We, we found that outreach um, and the investigations intelligence function of your agency should be completely separate. There, that way there is no misinterpretation about your intentions. You are there to provide policing services and connect with members of your community. You are not there to get information about potential terrorist attacks. Um, of course, if you build that relationship of trust, you may at some point have a community member come to you with concerns. And it should be clear what your role will be, who you will give that information to you, and then you will be, as an outreach and engagement team member, completely removed from any next steps. OK, that's the biggest one. Thank you. <laughs> Chief Thank <Major>. you. Thank <laughs> you, Jessica. <laughs> Let me uh, quickly uh, just make a couple of points about our recommendations that we'll turn over to uh, Chief Manager and Dahlia for their review. Uh, Jessica outlined a lot of the recommendations that are in the executive summary that you all have uh, with you uh, relating to what we recommend for policing agencies. Obviously, we recommend that they follow these promising practices. We also made some recommendations relating to the federal government. Uh, and the first one was that if we're, if we're going to take uh, this issue seriously, if we think that policing uh, can really contribute to preventing violent extremism, there needs to be some resources put behind uh, this effort. Uh, police departments have a lot on their plate. Uh, and uh, believe it or not, uh, uh, preventing terrorism, which is a very rare event, is not on the top of the agenda of most police departments around the country. It's about crime, violence, drugs, and other problems that uh, face communities on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so these outreach and engagement efforts are, are well supported by, in many places, uh, but in many places they are not. And I think if we want to really give a boost to this effort, we need to see some form of federal uh, funding uh, for it. Uh, second, uh, we found in a lot of our interviews uh, that while people talked about the community members, uh, you know, spoke well about their uh, police departments and the people that they knew locally, their distrust flowed from a great extent on their interaction with at least some federal officials. And we heard over and over, especially about people's treatment at airports and uh, immigration. Uh, now, we know the Department of Homeland Security has been engaged in trying to iron these things out and get people's names off of lists that shouldn't be. Uh, we call on uh, the federal government to redouble their efforts in this regard. You can't have people who, on one hand, are attending meetings with officials and promising their cooperation, their engagement, however uh, we can, and then have that same person go to an airport and then miss their flight because they are held up uh, uh, because of uh, issues uh, that uh, don't exist, that, that, that they're, 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 these are innocent, uh, uh, patriotic uh, people. Uh, indeed, who the police or other officials have asked to be part of this outreach engagement. And the third recommendation for the federal government is, you know, we do see a void in um, ideas, training, technical assistance, research relating to how police departments can engage, especially with, uh, to try to prevent anti-government racist forms of extremism. There's an idea that, well, uh, these are not folks who like the government, so how can we do outreach and engagement uh, with them? Uh, but the the fact of the matter is everybody uh, comes from a community, and if we are engaging essentially with innocent Muslims to try to prevent uh, violence by Muslims, uh, we can certainly uh, engage with innocent non-Muslim uh, communities to try to prevent those other forms of extremism. Uh, and finally, we do make a recommendation for Muslim American uh, communities. We interacted with a lot of them, uh, and we made recommendations at the end, which pretty much said, Listen, uh, work with the police. Uh, have an open and candid and transparent relationship. Tell them what you want. Uh, tell them what you don't like. But have that dialogue. Don't put up a wall 
to start due to past occurrences, maybe historical mistrust, uh, but give them a chance, uh, work together with them, and if they are willing, and we believe that they, uh, all the police departments we interacted with are uh, willing to abide by these you know, promising good practices, and if they don't do it at first, they certainly are learning institutions, uh, then, uh, then, then they, they will do so in the future. And you can build a relationship that will benefit you in many ways and then help us with uh, security problems uh, as well. With that, I'm going to turn it over to the chief. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tom Manger. I'm the chief of police in Montgomery County, Maryland. I'm also the president of the Major City Chiefs Association. It's an association of the largest 70 police departments in the United States, Canada, and now uh, the UK as well. Uh, we we um, deal with um, uh, the issues that large urban police departments are dealing with every day. And, and countering violent extremism certainly is, uh, I, I like the way that uh, it was characterized. It's not the, the uh, at the top of my list of things that, that I lose sleep over every night, um, but it's on the list. Um, there are certainly higher priorities for local police departments that we're dealing with, but um, uh, it, it, it is, uh, um, Dealing with, with terrorist activities and, and countering violent extremism certainly is part of, of the uh, things that, that local police departments are now dealing with that, in fact, before 9-11, uh, uh, we, we really weren't dealing with. Uh, we, we felt that was a federal responsibility. So it was with great interest that I read uh, this, this research, and I want to focus my comments on the 14 recommendations that, um, that start with policing agencies should. Um, because that this is my area of expertise, and uh, as I read through, I had um, thoughts and, and about each one of the recommendations. And I will tell you that uh, my overarching thoughts were: this, these are great recommendations. Um, any uh, a police department, especially uh, police departments in large urban areas, if they're not doing this kind of outreach, they, they certainly should be. And I, the fact that, that uh, it was mentioned that nine out of 10 uh, in the survey were doing them doesn't surprise me. They, in fact, it should be 10 out of 10. Um, one of the recommendations was to establish outreach and engagement units. There's really, I, I have two views on that. And I, uh, one, um, uh, you can have, uh, you can have a, a unit that does this targeted outreach. Um, they can be very effective. A, a great example is the, um, uh, the uh, LGBTQ um, units that some police departments have. Um, the fact is that I, my view has been that every police officer that I have uh, I want doing outreach and engagement activities. And if you just create a unit that says, okay, we're going to have this unit that uh, uh, deals with, um, uh, you know, a specific segment of our community, then sometimes the rest of the department feels like, well, we don't have to because they do that. We don't have to do that. The fact is that a lot of police departments take the uh, the view that uh, they want every single one of their police officers to be engaged in community policing, and part of that is being engaged in, in outreach uh, and engagement with, uh, with all of the uh, uh, segments of our community. So um, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with creating this unit, but you've got to make sure that, that you don't adopt that culture of, okay, well, I don't have to do outreach and community policing because they do it. All, everybody in the organization has to be engaged in that. Um, there was another recommendation that talked about don't use the term uh, CVE, don't use the term uh, countering violent extremism. Um, I, I think that there's, you can make arguments on both sides of that issue as well. On the one hand, I fully understand why that recommendation was in there. Um, you don't want to, uh, to have your outreach and this, this effort to be seen as anti-Muslim. You don't want it to be seen as anti-anyone in particular. The fact is it's anti-crime. Um, it is pro-safety of our community. So I understand that uh, using that term could, could uh, uh, make some segments of the community feel marginalized, but uh, in fact, I do think it's important that, that um, people know exactly what uh, the, the goal is, and that is, in fact, to counter violent extremism. It, in fact, is to keep our community safe. Violent extremism is not, um, uh, as we all know, um, uh, you know, no one thinks that this is targeted and strictly um, uh, targeted to the Muslim community, that countering violent extremists ha ha has anything to do with uh, only Islam. The fact is that the, the, the 50% of what we do um, is, is 
you, you can look at the sovereign citizen movement that's ongoing, uh, uh, white supremacy. You can look at, at gangs in general. All of these things can fit nicely into this um, CVE uh, basket. So, um, so I, again, I think you can um, make arguments about whether or not that recommendation is, is critical or not. Um, you know, address, uh, uh, addressing a, a basically an all crimes approach, that this is not strictly targeting any one type of crime or any one type of, of, of criminal activity uh, is important as well. And I think that goes to the, that recommendation is good in that it, it, it makes sure that the community understands that we're looking at everything. We're not, again, just targeting one specific group or one specific type of activity. Um, uh, the, um, uh, there's a recommendation that talks about making sure that the, you separate the outreach from the intelligence function. And I think I could name um, some police departments that, that got in trouble and, and sort of ran afoul of, of, uh, of this concept. And one of the responsibilities of, of a chief um, is to make sure that there is that firewall between the outreach uh, activities and the intelligence activities. Um, and uh, so that's an important recommendation and one that needs to be taken seriously if you don't want this, this whole effort to collapse. Um, because once uh, there, you, you know, someone is able to, to, to see that uh, Jesus' outreach activity has resulted in nothing but arrests, and you know, um, the, the, all of a sudden it becomes uh, uh, questionable as to the credibility of what this outreach activity is really trying to accomplish. Um, it, they talk about having a diverse workforce within a police department. Uh, that was one of the national conversations that came out of Ferguson, is that what, is, what does the police department look like? Should they reflect the diverse, and, and they should, in fact, reflect the diversity of the community that they're serving. And so that's uh, obviously an important uh, issue for all police departments to make sure that we're reflecting the diversity of our community. Cultural awareness training, uh, that's got to be relentless. So you, you start in the police academy with new recruits, and that cultural awareness training needs to continue throughout a police officer's career. Uh, I, I don't claim that my cops are experts on every culture and, and that sort of thing, but you've got to have a, enough of, a, a, of a, um, an understanding that you don't have a situation where I'm knocking on a door, and this happened to me, uh, where I'm knocking on a door to serve a warrant, and uh, a, 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 um, a Muslim woman answered the door, and I said I had a warrant for an individual, a member of her family. She told me he wasn't there, and I said, and normally what, what police would do is say, well, I've got a warrant. Can I come in and, and look around? I, and she, I said, well, you know, can I look around? She said, no, you can't come in. And, and I realized, I mean, it kicked in that right then, okay, she's here by herself. And so I, I told her, well, when, when can I come back? And she, she told me when, uh, later on when people would be in, in the house. I went back later and we were able to resolve that. And it could have gotten very ugly then, but again, the, the, it just me and my cops have enough cultural awareness training, whether it's, it's faith-based, whether it's uh, um, uh, or, or otherwise, um, to make sure that we're not creating problems um, when we're trying to, to, uh, to do our job. Basic language training, tremendously important. Again, I don't have to be fluent in every language, but at least having some ability to, to communicate and knowing where I can get the help I need to get translation services right there, right then, um, is, is very important. Um, outreach to the immigrant communities is tremendously important. Uh, I, I police a community that is um, uh, majority minority. It's, we're also um, one third of our residents are, were born in a country other than the United States. So outreach to immigrant communities, again, it has to be a relentless activity. That's a great recommendation. Um, wide variety of outreach and engagement. Again, you don't want to target one thing or one person or one group. Um, and uh, uh, I, I, want to, I want to finish by, by talking about um, the fact that I, I felt very affirmed as I read these uh, because we've got a, uh, an effort that we have uh, put in place in, in Montgomery County. It's been in place for a couple of years now. And uh, we, the, what makes it our, uh, what I really love about ours, and this is a little different than the recommendations here, and, and may want to, you may want to consider this, is that our effort um, uh, is is a community-led effort. We are so fortunate to have partnered with uh, Dr. Hedy, Dr. Hedy Amiramadi and Word, the World Organization for Research, Development, and Education. Uh, th that we have got a faith-based effort where we have um, uh, individuals from every faith. Um, 60 or 70 people strong who have led this effort uh, to, to educate the community. We've got the schools involved. And basically what we do is we, we're looking for folks that, uh, that 
uh, through their behavior, um, have uh, some, some uh, caught the notice of a school counselor, a school teacher, a parent, a, uh, a family member, a friend, and because of uh, some of their behavior, they've, there's a growing concern about if they're, they're, um, what, if they're being radicalized um, or if they're headed down the wrong path in terms of, of their activity. And uh, we are working with the faith-based community to intervene in these folks' lives, as typically young folks, to intervene in these folks' lives and try and get them back on track uh, to make healthy decisions. We've had a couple of cases that have, have ended up coming to the police department because there has been criminal activity involved. But the vast majority of cases um, that we intervene in is long before it becomes a criminal case. And so this is a community-led effort Police department is a is a strong partner with this effort, but it is a community-led effort, not a police-led effort, and we believe that's why it's been uh, so successful uh, for us in Montgomery County. Thank you, Chief. Thank you so much, Dahlia. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to open by saying that I think that the, the both the findings and the, and the recommendations of this report really take us forward, and and are an enormous improvement on um, on the status quo and on what many people are experiencing. So I I support the uh, the effort that was made and the recommendations I again uh, really are a, a step forward. Um, I want to start my my remarks just by kind of making an observation which is I think the report makes the case that it's not just programming but also intentions. That the community wants to be seen as a group of citizens, not a pool of suspects. I think that that's really important and, and everything has to start from there. And, I th and, and that's why this idea of a whole community and, um, and so you're not just focusing on Muslims, you're focusing on all communities that um, uh, are at risk of, uh, of extremism or radicalization, and you're not just focusing on the CVE uh, aspect of public safety, which we keep hearing is, um, it's actually among the more rare issues that are happening at the local level. And there are other things that are much more likely. And that's, that's often the response of American Muslims is, yeah, we're worried about, uh, you know, our kids joining ISIS, but we're far more worried that they're they're on drugs, that they're getting, um, that they're looking at porn. I mean, so the issues that are actually happening and the frequency of them are are so far um, removed from what seems to be the conversation all the time when it comes to American Muslims. Um, I, I had a question though: Is why isn't our national CVE? Um, strategy reflective of the realities on the ground. And, and I never get an answer, a really good answer to that. If the realities on the ground is that um, other forms of extremism are more likely than um, ISIS-inspired extremism, why is the CVE strategy at a national level only focused on um, ISIS-inspired um, extremism? Why isn't there a national security strategy for these other types of extremism with equal levels or, or proportional levels of funding and, um, and resources at the local level? I want to briefly talk about some of the details of the uh, police training recommendations. Again, I support the idea of um, cultural training and cultural competency. I'd just like to add, though, uh, a few things, a few thoughts to those uh, to those excellent recommendations. Language is is of course a great thing to have, but it would be unrealistic to expect every police officer, of course, to know every language. But what would be probably even more important is to examine the kind of training that police officers and law enforcement in general are getting. So we. Um, we know that there has been an unfortunate uh, number of cases of incredibly bigoted and Islamophobic material that law enforcement is being exposed to. That is actually, the, the problem isn't not having training, but having training that's very biased. So I think I was surprised that we didn't, I didn't find that in the report as uh, a really important red flag. So where is the training coming from? And to make sure that it's reputable and accurate. Um, the other piece that I, I didn't see enough of is a call out of the fact that radicalization actually does not occur in mosques. This is just, um, 
a fact. So if we look at all of the, the very high profile cases of American Muslims and radicalization, they did not get radicalized in their local mosque. So we are engaging local mosques. I think the implicit assumption is somehow that's where it's happening. It's really important to understand that it's not where it's happening. A lot of these cases, they are being kicked out of their local mosque, which maybe is another problem, but we, but it's actually what's happening is they're being excluded or being kicked out or self-selecting to leave because their perspective is not in line with the majority of the community members. So they're getting radicalized mostly either overseas or online um, where they're able to, um, they're either getting exploited that way or they're able to find like-minded people that they're not finding in their community with these radical views. So by engaging the local mosque, are we kind of going to where the problem is? Maybe we need a much stronger cyber security strategy than, um, than at just a simply a community outreach strategy. Where is the problem coming from? It's not in the local mosque, so maybe uh, a different strategy is needed. And then um, two, two other recommendations in general that are not covered by the report directly. One regarding media and one regarding definitions. So what I think you must have heard from Muslims, and I, and I think it's, it's been um, referred to, is this idea that the community is stigmatized in the media when there is an arrest or when there is um, a, sus you know, a suspected activity. And it's all over the media. It's likely not even just a local story, but a national story. And the equivalent amount of media is not afforded to anyone else who you know, might be arrested. And, and so they're not really sure um, who to blame. One, you know, some of the blame goes to the media for only selecting those stories. So I just recently read this buried article. I was shocked by this, but that last August, a group of people were charged with 99 years of prison for what the federal government, what, what the FBI called weapons of mass destruction that were targeting mosques, and they also wanted to kill the president. And they're getting 99 years in prison for this attempted crime and none of you have heard of it, and neither had I until I read this article somewhere in this obscure website. And I was so unsure that it was true that I actually clicked on the link and found the actual FBI you know, reference. So this is an actual story. This is true. I didn't make this up, and it's not you know, um, a hoax. And yet, a story like that, no one's heard of it. And, and uh, I don't know if it's the FBI doesn't, you know, hold press conferences about stories like this and only about Muslims, but this idea of stigmatization um, and media outreach and media involvement in, in, in Muslim um, arrests is, is very problematic. The second thing is just, I think you've heard this from every Muslim you talk to, I'm sure, because I hear it from every Muslim I talk to, which is definition of terrorism. It's, I, I, will, I will voice this frustration on behalf of so many people. What gets called terrorism is not being, um, this, this definition is not being applied consistently or even close to consistently. And I think that this is an, a very important issue when it comes to community engagement. People, you know, I will, I'll, I'll make this case. I don't think there's a community in America that is more interested in preventing violent acts in the name of Islam than the Muslim American community. They are hurt by it in every possible way. Um, so there is not a lack of interest in, in preventing these things. But there's all these other obstacles to uh, engagement on this because of all of, these, um, all of this baggage around stigmatization, around inconsistency in engagement, and inconsistency in definitions. Thanks. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dahlia. Yeah, I think uh, the thing to do now is uh, open it up to questions. I know there are members of the media and other officials. So please uh, do us a favor and uh, state your name uh, before you uh, do the question. Uh, Jeff has a microphone. So would anybody like to ask? Please. Here. Right here, Jeff. Jeff, turn, turn around. 
Hi, uh, Juleika from Next America National Journal. You didn't tell us um, the number of civilians that you spoke to or any data about the civilians. So if you could run through, you told us about uh, the police departments and all of that, so it would just be good. Try. Yeah, sure. So we did focus groups in uh, eight cities around the United States. Uh, each of those uh, uh, visits uh, lasted uh, two or three days. Uh, we spoke to uh, uh, roughly two dozen or more in each city. Focus groups ranged from three to eight people. Uh, in addition, we had conversations uh, outside of the focus groups. Uh, this is not a nationally representative sample. The idea was, as with focus groups uh, in general, to get conversations going that can juxtapose different uh, perspectives. Uh, and we made sure to include uh, people who uh, were of different um, ethnic, uh, racial uh, backgrounds and different uh, generations of having uh, come to the United States, uh, men and women in different age groups as well. What percentage were Muslim Americans? Uh, these were all Muslim American groups. This is within Muslim American communities, yes. I think also on our police site visits, uh, sometimes the uh, different police departments did arrange for us to interact with some of the top leaders that they were uh, yeah. working with. We went to seven agencies and we met with between 15 to 30 because um, we spent three days at each site. Um, and each night we would try to go to an event. So we would speak with people at the events as well as one-on-one um, -on -one interviews during the day that were arranged for us. And I do want to say we, saw a lot of the things that uh, Dahlia mentioned. Uh, not everything could make it into the report on policing, uh, but uh, a lot of those themes uh, we certainly heard. And I hope if you go back and actually, uh, uh, the report is lengthy, but if you look at some of the quotes that we pulled out, uh, I think you'll feel the passion uh, that uh, we experience in talking to community members about a lot of these issues. Please. John Iskander from the Foreign Service Institute. Thank you for the report. Uh, two quick questions. One for Dahlia, I don't think you finished your thought about the definitions problem. I don't, at least I didn't understand what you're pointing to on the other side of that, uh, what, where the lack of consistency is. So if you could please elaborate on that. And then for everybody from the chief as well as the members of uh, the research, uh, one of the things that I've, um, in my, I'm not on the law enforcement side of this, but I encounter people, and one of the things that I've been interested in is how do you do prevention, which is the whole purpose of what you're talking about. And it seems to me one of the crucial aspects of this is, is getting, as you said, Chief, to, uh, to people before they engage in actual criminality, right? Because once they're in that world, then everything comes down from law enforcement. And yet, certainly, I think one of the common conceptions in the community uh, certainly Arab community and, and I think the Muslim communities broadly has been that things tend to, uh, that law enforcement tends to direct things towards um, criminality, if you will, in other words, to a place where you can get convictions, uh, thereby stopping, say, terrorism, as, a f as opposed to preventing things before they actually happen. So, Chief, you mentioned that this is something that you try and do on a really regular basis, and I'm wondering what, what you all, in terms of your research, have found police departments and other law enforcement people, including the FBI, doing to try and stop and redirect away from criminality in ways that are actually more productive. So thank you. Okay, so I'll start with what I, you know, or I'll elaborate a little bit about consistency of definition, that we have to apply the, war, the definition uh, of terrorism consistently across communities. And um, the impression that many American Muslims have, and, and I think is, quite accurate is that, you know, the, the going definition of, of terrorism, at least in, in sort of public discourse, is a, a violent act committed by a Muslim. And um, when other people commit violent acts in the name of some other ideology, it's called lots of other things, but not terrorism. And, and it's not just about PR. It's, it's really actually much, much more serious in, in my view because convictions and, and jail time and things like that matter in terms of how it's defined. So 
there was a case uh, in, I think, 2002 of a man who had the intention, he had blueprints and a manifesto and, and the police found it um, in his apartment because his wife called the police because of domestic abuse, so totally separate thing. But they happened to find all this, um, you know, bomb making material. He had the, the plan to bomb um, like 40 mosques in his area in the name of a specific ideology. And he was charged with a hate crime. Hate crimes and terrorism have very, very different, you know, consequences. So the issue of a, a definition um, that is, that we come up with, that we agree on, and that is applied consistently, I think is really important. There's, um, uh, 12 years ago, I, I sat on a task force that was trying to deal with, with gangs. And uh, we developed uh, uh, what we thought at the time was a, a pretty comprehensive strategy. And it was um, uh, prevention, intervention, in, uh, enforcement. And of course, the, the police have the enforcement side. But what our philosophy was that if we were dealing with enforcement issues, then prevention and intervention had failed. And that's where we really needed to make our investment. And so um, the, the, I think that the prevention piece of this is tremendously important. And um, you, know, we've, you can um, interview uh, 100 people that are, that, are, you know, uh, spending, uh, that are living in a prison somewhere and talk to them about uh, what got them there. And you, know, you, you, you see what at-risk issues they dealt with, um, uh, you know, whether it was to, to, that caused them to join a gang, to cause them to get involved with, with drugs and, uh, you know, uh, and drug abuse, to cause them to, to commit suicide, um, uh, you know. So investing in uh, um, the, the, our community partners, and schools are number one on that list, you know, to try and deal with some of the um, mental health issues. Um, and some other things that uh, if we can intervene early in someone's life, see, you know, look at the behavior, catch a red flag somewhere and think, well, you know, we, we, let's, let's uh, put some time and effort into to trying to get this individual back on the right track. That's, um, for us, that, that's what prevention's all about and that's where we really want to invest um, our, our resources and, and police don't play as big a part in, in that, but we have a big stake in it. So we're, we're willing partners to do whatever we can. You know, uh, let me just uh, quickly comment on some of the you know, interviews that we did. Uh, all the different police departments we spoke to said, hey, we would love to have a developed infrastructure to deal with intervention. People who seem like they have adopted um, possibly a, uh, a violent ideology but haven't committed a crime yet or maybe have even done some precursor kinds of things but they don't feel like they have to charge them, uh, that they could be diverted to to try to, you know, turn them away for violence. And that's been done in other areas of, of law enforcement, uh, certainly. But uh, even in some of the uh, departments where, you know, been working on this for a long time, uh, that's still very undeveloped. Uh, and those are not going to be government programs. As the chief said, you know, to have that community partner that uh, provides that kind of programming and knows, has resources that uh, can be turned to, that's what police departments really need. And they would love to see those things develop. But I think the, the programming needs to be done at the community uh, level. And then there has to be partnership with the police department. So there can be the right people can be diverted. And then the whole part, part, point of our report is for that whole system to work, you really need trust and relationships. And uh, you know, if those don't exist first, then this more advanced step isn't going to, 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 to be able to work yet. Just one quick thing. Um, to echo what Chief Major said and reiterate some of the things that have already been said by the panel, um, we did meet with some agencies that had developed partnerships with other government agencies in the county. And after building those relationships of trust and um, assessing the needs of some of the community members, they would connect them to appropriate people within the community, like social workers, or help them get food stamps, or reduced fee bus passes, or language assistance. 
And these are forms of prevention because they're helping the members of the community feel like they're part of the community. Uh, my name is Omer Khan from Muflehon. Um, community policing um, is a concept which has existed for many years, right? Decades even. And it's not just about um, outreach done by law enforcement. It has several other principles with it, and it also requires adjustments of how police departments are structured. Um, and again, the basis of it also has an assumption of geography. Um, it is geographically focused and who and how the relationships are built. Given the reality of how the Muslim population is distributed across the country, and where we do have numbers where even in violent extremism, a lot of the recruiting is happening online. In your research, did you find what principles of community policing, at the very core of it, have to be adjusted, improved, or changed to actually meet the needs or the concept of violent extremism or the way recruiting is happening for violent extremism? Because a lot of these recommendations are just about better community engagement. Well, I think the chief got to one of those issues in terms of structure in his comments, and I'll certainly let him uh, reiterate that, uh, is that uh, because most Muslim communities are, there are not large concentrations, it is much more diffuse over geographic area. That's, I think, one of the reasons it led us to the idea of, you know, outreach specialists that uh, were not, you know, people who had assignments for a particular precinct. That said, it's good if you can spread the uh, philosophy across uh, as many people within the uh, Bureau. And I just want to point out, you know, we started with the whole idea of community policing, and it's in the title of the report. And we, we did, you know, start by looking at the literature and the tradition of community policing and certainly felt that it was a model that uh, could have applicability to uh, this problem. Let, let me turn over to Chief. I don't know if Jessica wanted to comment on that either. Um, a, couple of, a couple of reactions to that. But one, um, I absolutely agree that um, uh, th what Dahlia said was that, you know, radicalization is not occurring in mosques. And I'll tell you where it's occurring. And I'm not talking about just um, uh, uh, this is not unique to Muslim. Any radicalization, whether it's white supremacy, sovereign citizen, uh, you name it. Um, it's going on in, in, a, in a basement somewhere, in a bedroom somewhere, with the individual sitting in front of a computer. That's where the radicalization is occurring. Um, the, um, uh, and in terms of the, the community policing, it has been around forever. Um, community policing is, is not a program, it is a philosophy, and there's two, there's two cornerstones. One is community outreach, community engagement. The other is problem solving. So you identify a problem and you've got to come up with a, with a solution. And one size does not fit all for any problem nor any community. So uh, I think that, that police departments need to be adaptable, they need to be flexible, and they need to be creative in terms of how they approach um, uh, these problems. And, and if you want to just pick the problem of, of countering violent extremism, um, again, one size does not fit all. You've got to be adaptable, flexible, and got to react to the issues in, in your particular community. Charlie. There's a couple of uh, uh, points. Uh, the, this long tradition of community policing uh, has many different strands to it, and I think you're referring to some of the strands that we didn't make uh, a large reference to in our report, uh, one being, for example, community oversight of law enforcement and government agencies. Uh, another, though, is that if, if radicalization is occurring uh, in front of computers, uh, uh, still, Face-to-face -face interaction remains hugely important in, in improving uh, relationships between law enforcement and communities on a whole host of issues uh, and remains important. And that side of community policing, the face-to-face -face side, may not catch every single instance of potential violence. Uh, there will probably still be violence in the world, even if community policing is, is uh, uh, fully adopted as a philosophy. But it's good in its own right, and that's what we're seeing, is the building of trust among communities, uh, between communities and law enforcement is a good thing in its own right, regardless, even separate from isolated instances of radicalization. You know, and I don't think community police officers are going to necessarily be having the face-to-face -face with the young person in front of the commuting, uh, computer. That's not the idea. That person has a family, that person goes to work, that person interacts with others in the community. I think what you're trying to do is create an early warning system. Uh, and to have that kind of early warning system, you have to have broad reach into 
uh, to the innocent people, and that is the case of community policing that's been applied to other forms of uh, violent crime, gang violence as well. Uh, the community police officers are working with, you know, non-criminals, non, -criminals, non you know, community leaders to uh, build those kind of programming, trust, outreach, uh, and you know, to then use that to reach the more difficult to reach uh, elements of the population. I think we had somebody who was very interested in asking a question back there. Sure. Mehreen Farouk, a senior fellow at Word. Um, first of all, I want to thank you all, David, Charles, and Jessica. I'm very much looking forward to the report, and I commend you for this great effort. It's been a long time coming, and thank you again, Chief Manger, for the great um, uh, mention. So the question that I had was, um, in terms of preventative policing, as, as we've been discussing, this is not necessarily a new concept. We've used it in gang prevention efforts and so on. But it's sort of a, a new twist to apply it towards CVE. So in a lot of our, um, our trainings and our engagements with communities, with police, um, we find that you know, training uh, individuals on how to identify vulnerable individuals, understanding what the various potential risk factors of violent extremism are, this almost requires a cultural shift, particularly within law enforcement, to, um, to kind of get in touch with the sort of social work aspect of their, their job. So I was wondering if that came up in your interviews and, and in the focus group discussions, if you can talk a little bit more about that, because um, as uh, Chief Major may be able to speak towards, you know, we've been able to um, Im implement a social worker directly in Montgomery County Police Department, which I believe has been instrumental in improving community policing and especially uh, in CV efforts. Um, so is that something that you would recommend that could be applied in other jurisdictions? Would you recommend greater funding to support that type of work? So any thoughts on sort of expanding and pushing that needle in that direction would be great. Sure. Jess. Um, I'll just comment on what we heard from our interviews. And that wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> um, that goes back to our recommendation about picking the right people for the outreach and engagement team, because it has to be folks that do have that um, ability to connect with people and realize that the social work part of it is so important. Um, this is not the crime-fighting police officer who wants to go arrest people. This is the officer who wants to engage and connect with folks, learn about different cultures, different religions, is naturally curious, and also willing and able to connect individuals to the different organizations I was talking about, the different county agencies or community organizations that can offer the other social services that they are in need of. So yes, we did hear that, and yes, we think it's important for if you're creating an, a specific outreach and engagement team. We can just bolster that, because Jess and I were on the same interviews. I mean, we asked that very question, that very terminology came up. And we asked them that, well, that sounds a lot more like social work than police work. And what they said is, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And what these folks who do this on a day-to-day -day basis, they're interested in solving problems. And, whether the, and the, the preference is to solve a problem without using the criminal justice system. Uh, if that's necessary, they're more than willing to do it. But uh, uh, they admitted fully and that the people who do this really like trying to solve those problems. I mean, that is what they are, are doing. Uh, but they admitted that that is not necessarily the culture that pervades uh, either in their entire department or in, in law enforcement in general, but it certainly does within some. And so we think that attitude is you know, really what's needed to get a handle on this particular problem. Chief, did you want to follow up? Uh, the only thing I would say is that, that because there is so often a mental health component to, to many of these um, uh, interventions, that having a social worker um, uh, actually within the police department um, has just been invaluable. It's just. Uh, can I, we can are, I just add one? Yeah, one sure, of course. I, I really wish that this, everything you've just said would be broadcast nationally <laughs> and everyone would understand this. This idea that there's a mental health component is never discussed. It's like I, I joke sometimes that, you know, we think there's no prevention for mental health, but in fact, being a Muslim makes you completely immune. You cannot be mentally ill if you're a Muslim, according to the public discourse. So to, to understand that there's all kinds of uh, 
complexity to where people go wrong, where people become radicalized, I think is, is essential. The second thing is this idea of where and how people get radicalized, that it's closing down mosques is how you increase radicalization, not how you decrease it. So we'll take uh, a couple more questions and we'll, then we'll try to answer them all at once. Then we will finish up. Uh, so uh, let's go over to Mike uh, and then uh, two people have had their hand up in the, this row and we'll try to answer those all at once. So if you could keep it to one concise question, that would be great because I did promise try to end as close to two as possible. Right here, Mike. We'll be right there. Ah. Jennifer Bellamy, ACLU. My question is, are there consequences to being identified as in need of prevention? And also, what are the criteria for determining that a uh, youth is at risk and in need of prevention? Okay. Uh, Mike, behind you, Mike German. Uh, and mine actually follows up on that, which is, number one, what are the criteria by which somebody gets referenced? And for Chief Manger, what would be the criteria that would have you say this goes to social work and this goes to the police. Okay, sorry, uh, Jeff, two folks over here had their hands up for a while. Thank you, Aisha Rahman with Karama. I have um, just a quick question. I'm heartened by this discourse of broadening definitions and kind of saying that this is, there. number one, there are a lot of other issues besides uh, what we have come to know as CVE that our communities are dealing with. And secondly, what Dahlia was talking about is how our resources allocated. And my question is, uh, the very first recommendation that you have for Muslim communities is that we should um, comply with law enforcement. And I'm troubled by this recommendation because um, as an advocate working in this field, I have always heard so many stories that I could spend you know, the next 20 minutes on of how Muslim communities, in fact, have reported um, incidents or suspicions or whatnot to law enforcement and have always complied. So I want to know, where did that recommendation come from? What evidence do you have to suggest that Muslim communities are not, in fact, complying and working with law enforcement? Um, and I'll leave it at that since. Hi, I'm Daniel Tutt with Unity Productions Foundation. My company offers training in cultural competency to police departments across the country. And Eric Holder made a uh, reform at the level of trying to tackle these bigoted trainings. And I'm wondering if you think that that reform has been effective. The issue is that there's two, type, there's two types. There's cultural competency and there's counterterrorism. It's in the category of counterterrorism where the bigoted stuff happens. The CVE stuff since Obama is very fine for the most part, but it's really former uh, veterans and military officials and former Marines, people that went to Iraq, that are giving those trainings and that definitely have an ax to grind with Islam. Um, how do we tackle that? If that's my question, because they're still happening. All right, let's see if we can uh, uh, cover a couple of these. Uh, I'm just looking at the, uh, the recommendation, the first one for Muslim American community says engage with police departments to address public safety and other core concerns of the community. So the comply, uh, you know, I was surprised because I, you know, that's not the kind of language that we generally use and Charlie and I have been doing research and talking on this very point uh, uh, and he's compiled lots of data about the number of tips and all that have uh, been provided to Muslim communities to uh, you know identify individuals and and stop plots. So uh, you know I think Muslim Americans are really the the part of the solution, uh, and we've talked about that many times. So maybe we can talk afterwards if there's some language difficulties if it, it wasn't intended. Uh, on the um, training point, we do talk in the report a little bit about training. Didn't make it, and uh, that part didn't make it into the recommendations. You know, there is just a little bit of a, almost a cottage industry, you know, as you mentioned, and, you know, uh, we do talk about in the report, I'm sorry it wasn't highlighted in the executive summary, but, um, you know, that's really on the ch chief of police, I, I would say, chief manager can talk about that, but they've got to be very aware of who they are exposing their uh, departments to and understand that, uh, you know, you can talk about the history and where this threat comes from in a realistic way uh, without whitewashing it in any way. 
uh, but uh, you can also do a lot of damage uh, with that kind of training that is so biased. Uh, and we recognize that. We saw examples of communities that complained uh, bitterly about that. And you're right, it, it can come, this uh, can come from uh, even a former uh, police uh, officer as well. So that's on the, uh, that's on the, the, the police departments to make sure. We do say in our report that one of the ways you can mitigate that is to vet any sort of training with some of your community members. Have them take a look at it. Um, I guess it just didn't make it to the executive summary, but that is in the report. Great. It is Great. in there? Thank you. Okay, uh, Chief Mandala, Chief, did you want to talk about the whole question of how people might be ID'd for prevention and if there were consequences uh, yeah. uh, for that? I was trying to make I was trying to answer every question, and, and I've got notes <laughs> for all of them. Um, so, uh, uh, whether uh, an uh, issue goes through to the to the intervention strategy, or whether it would go over to you know where we would initiate some uh, criminal investigation, has one thing it's behavior I mean what what is the behavior what is the action that, that um, has caused this to come to our attention that uh, someone has brought it to our attention and typically I mean we've had actually very few that uh, that the first uh, um, where the case was was brought to, to uh, the group's attention was already a criminal matter and uh, very few of them actually end up that way most of these are do go down the, the prevention and intervention path and it all has to do with it you know was it was a kid involved in a fight at school and he said you know he said some things that caused people to you know some alarm you know because of some of the things that that uh, he said um, th those would not go to law enforcement I mean Assuming that the fight's just a, you know a, just a, a typical fight in a school, um, uh, you know when when uh, you know it comes to our attention that you know an individual has has uh, uh, not only gone to several websites and talked at school with his friends about uh, how he's he's making these bombs in his house um, and uh, and and you know we we through some. Uh, uh, way we find out that you know he's actually purchased bomb making materials well then it might end up going to the police first for investigation but that those those are fairly rare um, uh, and the, in terms of the training um, that, you, that you great answer I mean first of all most of our community training we get from the community we don't we don't just go to some oh some guy who says he's an expert you know and and, uh, and bring him in uh, it's typically uh, we we uh, we have Montgomery County we, we have uh, blessed with with great um, community partners and we actually will go to the community get recommendations for them or have we have people who offer to come in and do the training. In fact, if I took everybody who offered to come in and train my, there's, do you know that there's not one problem in our world that cannot be solved by better police training? I'm convinced of that. <laughs> um, so, but, but we get people all the time saying, yo, well, you know, we, we can come in and help you with the training. So we actually take advantage of those and we vet the training and do invite uh, community members in to, to um, you know, give their evaluation of the training. And what we find, and I will, I will I could go on forever about this, but what we find is, it's like well, you get an individual say, "Oh, well, that was good, but you know, I could do better." And so we we end up, um, you know, but I think we we're, we're in a good, pretty good place with that. I just want to contrast that approach of looking at behavior versus, um, you know, racial profiling, which we which we've been hearing about in different places, uh, and and contrast it with some of the approaches that we've seen and read about overseas and pr primarily in Europe where that alarm bell is sounded not because of behavior but because of say increased religiosity and uh, to, to really underline the point that that is a bad way to find uh, someone who's prone to extremism that when you look at the people who uh, carried out the Paris attack if that's how you were going to find criminal behavior or, or someone who's getting ready to, to do a major terrorist attack, you would have never found those guys because they were not uh, particularly religious. If you look at their behavior before their attack, they were doing the opposite of what you would expect in terms of religious uh, Muslim. So uh, I, I really want to um, congratulate uh, you all on, on this report and focusing on the idea of what we would look for in any criminal um, investigation, which is criminal behavior rather than um, a, you know, an imagined profile of what a terrorist looks like. Okay, I think we're going to uh, end there. I want to invite everybody. We have some uh, coffee, cookies to a reception. If you will 
go past the elevators and Barrett just left, uh, you'll see the Duke and DC office. We'd love to continue the conversation there. Thank you to our guests and for all of you for coming today.